I'm so glad you're here for another episode of Mechanism Monday, where every Monday we write out the electron pushing arrow mechanisms for different chemical transformations. In last week's video, I asked if you could solve the mechanism for this chemical transformation. So if you haven't had a chance, pause the video now and try it independently. And make sure you stick around to the end because I'll give you another mechanism to solve for next week's video. This reaction looks relatively straightforward at first. However, if you notice, one of the tricky things about this is that you're turning an ester into a carboxylic acid in your product. The first step in this transformation is probably what you would expect, where the potassium terputoxide can act as a paste to deprotonate either of the alpha carbon hydrogens at these carbon positions, which are adjacent to the esters. And this is because those electron withdrawing groups are going to make those alpha carbon hydrogens highly susceptible to nucleophilic attack because they're more acidic. So that is the first step in this transformation where you're forming an enolate species. And an enolate forms via these electrons moving down to making a negatively charged oxygen and a carbon-carbon double bond, or what you can think of as like a nucleophilic carbon. So that nucleophilic carbon is effectively like having a carbon nucleophile, or like a lone pair of electrons that's negatively charged, or a carbanion at that position. So that is basically the way that this reacts. So what that means then is that this carbon position can come and attack electrophiles like this electrophilic carbon as part of this carbonyl compound, which will kick up these pi electrons. So the product of this transformation is going to be that six-membered ring, which now has a negatively charged oxygen on it, as well as two of these esters. So notice that this carbon and this carbon is what is attached, and then from there, there is one, S, one carbon away from that ester. Now importantly, there is another carbon that is adjacent to that, and then you form another ester. So the, ring, the distance of these atoms from, this from these esters from this carbon differs by one carbon. So now we have two different esters located at these positions, and remember that the esters contain a carbon with two oxygen atoms attached to them, pulling electron density away from that carbon, making that carbon electrophilic. So then that means that it will be susceptible to nucleophilic attack by neighboring nucleophiles like this newly negatively charged oxygen. So then what will happen is that this will come and attack this ester, which allows us to form a five-membered ring. And this is going to be the more likely position that it would attack as opposed to this carbon, which would form a four-membered ring, which is going to be more strained. And notice that this is one oxygen is position one. This carbon would be position two, this carbon would be position three, and if it had attacked here, that would be a four-membered ring, but instead it comes and attacks this other one because that would be the fifth atom away from that oxygen, giving us a five-membered ring as part of our next product. So then we end up with a six-membered ring here, where we have a fused five-membered ring system. And again, this attacked a carbonyl carbon, kicking up these pi electrons, meaning that now there's a negatively charged oxygen here, giving us a charge balance. At the other position is where the rest of the ester would be located. Then we would have one carbon away would be the location of our other ester, which is still over here and untouched. If we consider position one to be the oxygen, then it attacked position number five of the carbonyl, which means that carbon number four is here, carbon number three is here, which is where the ester is coming off, and it's still coming off here, and this makes this position number two of that new five-member ring. And this is how you can check your structures. So remember, we had a base or a negatively charged alkoxide as part of this reaction. So what can happen next is to reform an alkoxide if these electrons come down and kick off ethoxide which would be a relatively reasonable leaving group under these conditions, which were initially basic. So this will come and kick off the alkoxide, ethoxide specifically, and giving us a new ester at this position. So the product of this transformation is where we have a new five-membered ring, where at this position you have a carbonyl carbon. So then our five-membered ring looks like this, and still coming off this side is where you can find this ester. So at this position, we still have our ester. So then either that ethoxide that we kicked off here or another tert-butoxide can come in and do another alpha carbon deprotonation. So now we have that ethoxide that we kicked off, or again, we could just use another one of these sodium terputoxides. And at this position, we have an alpha carbon hydrogen, which is gonna be acidic, that can be deprotonated by this alkoxide. These electrons can come down and form a new carbon-carbon double bond at this position, which is actually going to serve to open our ring. And in fact, this is going to make this carbon-to-oxygen bond break, 
giving us a negatively charged species there, and again, keeping our charge balance. So then the product of this transformation is only one step away from our final product, because now remember we have created a new carbon to carbon double bond here, and this is how we get this alkene that's present in our product. We have, coming off of this side, we still have our ester, but then we also have a situation where we have two carbons away from that, so one, two carbons away from that, a COO minus, which just needs to be protonated. And again, we generated ethanol here. Uh, we also generated terbutanol in our first step, which means that we have proton sources, which can come and protonate this position in order to give us this carboxylic acid that's formed in our final product. And this reaction is cool because it's actually solvent free. So we can use this cyclohexanone, we can use this diester, deprotonate it to do some alpha carbon enolate type chemistry, and then we can use that to make new carbon-carbon bonds at this electrophilic carbon position. Subsequently, we can do a five-membered ring formation as opposed to the four-membered ring formation to generate a new negatively charged oxygen where these electrons will come down, kick off an alkoxide, and then that alkoxide can come back and deprotonate another alpha carbon hydrogen, allowing us to open up that ring, giving us this carboxylate, which later gets protonated to form that carboxylic acid. If you enjoyed this week's mechanism, make sure to give it a thumbs up down below. For next week, I'd love to see if you could figure out the electron pushing arrow mechanism for this chemical transformation. Drop your thoughts as a comment down below and make sure that you subscribe to the channel so that you never miss another Mechanism Monday. I'll see you next week.